doing the oral history project as part of the 50th anniversary. I'm in doing the interviewing, Carol Paul from the social science department, and Mark Gaynor is the filmmaker. Uh, it's being done on March 6, 1995, in Office A331, and our interviewee is Eve, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Okay, my name is Eve Pollack, and I am the chairperson of the marketing department at FIT. And uh, the number of years that I have been involved with FIT is uh, since 1978, which makes it approximately 17 years. And as far as my academic background is concerned, um, I'll give you a litany. <laughs> it's, uh, I have a bachelor's degree from New York University. I have a master's degree from New York University. I have uh, 27 credits in financial services planning, and I spent a good part of my career in there. I wear two hats. I wear the fashion hat, and I was in that uh, field for 17 years. I bought a couture ready to wear. And um, uh, my last position in the, fa in the fashion business was at the Tailored Woman, which goes back a long time ago. And after that uh, store closed, um, I decided to uh, go into uh, financial services. And um, I have um, a teaching license from the New York City Board of Education in business subjects. So I have uh, presumably uh, two master's degrees, one uh, in business, an MS from NYU, and 27 credits uh, teaching license from the Board of Education. And then I have 27 credits uh, in uh, tax law, uh, business negotiations, corporate law, uh, dealing with financial services for corporations. And I was involved in that for a number of years, selling these kinds of services to corporations, including fringe benefits to them, which in fact becomes a tax deduction to their corporation. Could you explain, you mentioned quartier, quartier. Uh, the type of clothes you went could to it you already made could you explain a little bit yes I will explain that um, when I graduated from college I went into a, a buying office and um, I really didn't know what that buying office was like I applied for a position I got this position this company dealt only with very expensive clothes the highest price in the apparel industry, industry, for instance, uh, Pauline Trigier, for instance, uh, um, Bill Blass, which at that time was Anna Miller, and there was a relationship in that company with a brother and sister of another company called Maurice Rentner. So uh, my background is primarily the high couture fashion business and um, I enjoyed it very very much it was a very very exciting time in the fashion business um, the apparel business at that time was in its heyday what time is this what period it was uh, 19 approximately 1955 1954 till 1970. And you say it was in the heyday, what? Uh, the heyday was uh, a lot of production was done in this country. Um, uh, the inexpensive manufacturers uh, did offshore production. The apparel business at that time of the couture apparel business had five seasons to it and uh, their fashion shows were uh, the most glamorous and what can I tell you the most exciting 
Uh, the industry has since changed. A lot of production is done offshore. Even the most expensive uh, producers today do offshore producing. So there, of course, is less quality control than what we had in those days. The clothes were magnificent. They were magnificently made. And I have to say uh, that uh, I really understand good clothes. Besides which, my father was a textile converter. So I feel that really I was born to this industry. I don't know that too, too many people in the school know it, but some people do know that my father was a textile converter. And uh, I got a lot of experience just going into his company and uh, looking at fabrics, uh, beginning to understand uh, good fabrics, and then of course, a little lower down, rayons in those days. So I, I got a very, very good feel of the fashion industry uh, from, I would say, my early youth. What is exactly does a textile converter do? A textile converter takes what we call gray goods, which is spelt G-R-E-I-G-E. -E. It's unfinished goods that comes off a textile machine, weaving machine. The material is usually slugged, not so clean, <clears throat> excuse me, not so clean. Uh, what a textile converter does, he buys this gray goods. He dyes it according to the specifications of what the industry wants. And um, sometimes a fabric comes out a little thin, but in the process of conversion, they can make the fabric thicker in the hand, which is called sizing. And uh, therefore, I got a good background in textiles. I cannot claim to be any kind of an expert in it, but uh, my father was. And so, uh, as I said, I got a um, good grounding in uh, the field of fashion and um, fabrics and clothes. So um, uh, that's really where I started. Uh, but uh, through the years, as I um, grew into the industry and the industry began to change a bit, I decided that after being in the industry for 17 years, I was going to go into this financial planning business. And I have to say that I was very successful in that industry. On the other hand, I've always loved the fashion business. And one day I went to one of my professors at NYU, who is now gone, and uh, she was Professor Emeritus at NYU. And I said to her, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to do something in the fashion business. And she said, and why not? So she called Professor Gottnick at that time. And uh, I started to teach two classes on the weekends the introduction to the fashion business. That was a field that I was totally familiar with and very competent to teach. And I taught that class uh, for a number of years. And then I decided- As you were working as a financial consultant? As I was working as a financial consultant. <clears throat> and, um, I looked at FIT and I looked at the FBM department and of which I was then an adjunct and I said, gee, this must be a nice place to work. And maybe I could, um, or maybe I should apply for a full-time job. And I um, tried that once or twice and then I got a full-time job. And I worked at the, at, in the FBM department very diligently. Um, I would say at that time I really gave it my all as far as a teacher is concerned and uh, as I said I got a full-time job and what we did at that time Professor Gottnick felt that the FM 113 course should have a business component to it 
uh, Which course is that if you would? Introduction to the fashion business. I wrote the business component to it, and the uh, FBM department used that for many years. Uh, it was a four-credit course, and now I understand that they're taking that out, uh, that business component, and there are other uh, departments in the college that do uh, financial um, management courses. And so they're incorporating that body of knowledge into other courses in our business and technology division. So um, on the other hand, I feel that since I was in financial services, and in that kind of service, you really have to market yourself because there's nothing else that you're marketing but yourself for future performance. So um, I uh, was in that business, as I said, for a long time. At the same time, um, I was able to make a contribution to the FBM department because of the fashion background, a buying background. I was a buyer for tailored woman. In those days, I was a buyer for a chain store in Chicago, one of the finest, Bramson's. They're out of business now. Uh, and then I uh, was a catalog buyer as well for a company. Which means what's it? A popular. Uh, Popular Planning, I think it's called that today, but in my day it was called Popular Merchandise. What is a catalog book? It buyer? was a, ca a catalog buyer is very much like a mail order catalog. Now I'll tell you what I did in that company. I was primarily hired because of my fashion background. In those days, catalogs, particularly apparel, did not make expensive clothes. So actually what I was doing with my career was trading down in the sense that the clothes in a catalog were not nearly as expensive as the clothes that I bought. On the other hand, the company felt that because I had that background, I would be able to bring in to the company clothes that could be copied down to a much lower level. So I, that's what I did. I had a room full of clothes, just like any stylist or copyist would have. I brought back lots of clothes. One of my big jobs at this company was to shop all the department stores, bring the clothes back, work with textile firms a year in advance to see what fabrics I can translate into this lower category, and then work with manufacturers who were specifically geared to companies that were in, catal in the catalog business. And at that time, they worked for J.C. Penney, for Sears, for Montgomery Ward, and uh, for my company. This was uh, when, what, about when? It was uh, prior to 1978. Okay. Uh, since coming here, uh, you mentioned there's been changes in the apparel industry. Have you seen changes at FIT since you've been here? In terms of student body courses, definitely, I have seen you know, a change in the kind of Yes, I, first of all, we now do what I have done as a catalog buyer because of the uh, offshore production. We have a lot in the FBM department, a lot of emphasis on product development. It has a lot to do uh, with the type of work that I did, and I'm sure through the years it's been changed and enhanced, and there are different methods now, but many of the stores at that time did not do product development. 
Now they are doing a lot of private label, and the industry evo evolved into private label branding where many stores go abroad, just as Macy's has their own product development corporation here, and a lot of the production is done offshore in various parts of the world. And through that, I think we have developed an international trade area of specialization where today corporations look for places where to manufacture merchandise, and that's called sourcing. So um, the industry is, uh, is advanced. Uh, it's very, very different from when I was in it. I like to stay abreast of uh, new developments. Uh, but the area now that I am involved in is very clear generic marketing courses. And I'll get to that in a few moments. But to answer your other question of how did the student body change, I think the student body has drastically changed. I think years ago the students uh, were extremely motivated. They were going into an industry that was also very exciting and very profitable. Today we have a lot of changes in our industry. Um, a lot of firms in the better market have closed. We are really considered a service industry today where the offices are here for instance on 7th Avenue and much of the production is done in foreign countries now in 1985 and I'm sure there were a, a few years before that President Feldman felt that we should have a marketing department where students will get a bachelor's degree in marketing and fashion-related industries. At that time, I was uh, a full-time uh, instructor in the FBM department, and um, I was chosen by President Feldman at that time to head up this new department. Of course, I was very highly honored that it's um, a great challenge uh, for me. He could have picked a lot of other people in that department, and I must say I have developed a lot of enemies because of that. I don't want to get into that. If you want to take it out the script, you can take that out. But uh, I have developed a lot of enemies. And uh, because of that, uh, there has been an uphill battle in uh, the success of this department. We have a number of areas of specialization. Uh, we have, uh, to be exact, seven of them. We have marketing heading, merchandise management, marketing communications, international trade, cosmetic marketing, home furnishings, textile marketing, and now we have a new one, direct marketing. Every one of these areas of specialization, that is any student entering that program, must take the core marketing courses of the marketing department in order to get a degree. So totally, and this I'm saying uh, very open and very bluntly, uh, that all the students out of these areas of specialization must go through my marketing courses. 
Uh, some people feel very turfed in this school. They feel that they would like to center the marketing courses around their own areas of specialization. I, on the other hand, uh, do not approve of that. Not because I'm looking for any glory in my marketing department, because if I became the chair in 1986 openly, it's going to be 10 years that I'm the chairman here. So I'm not looking for any glory at this time. I'm just interested in the students. Uh, I feel that every student should have the opportunity of getting the broadest based marketing experience in order to be competitive in the world today. So if we are using courses that are geared specifically to each option, that in my opinion does not broaden the student's background for years to come. In other words, if a student uh, gets his marketing courses out of an area of specialization and either doesn't go into that field upon graduation or stays in that field two or three years, I don't feel that that's going to enhance that student's um, marketability if it's a narrow concept. As a matter of fact, most educators today are going the broad-based approach because of the uh, competition that we have out there and uh, students should have epi every opportunity to be um, uh, valuable to an industry with the background that they have had in its generic pure marketing sense because marketing is marketing the principles of marketing remain the same whether it's merchandise marketing or whether it's textile marketing the students learn the skills in the company the principles and the theory they don't learn there so the application of the theory to the practical is something that I highly advance. The, the, what I'm saying is the theory. The theory stands in every area. And I don't think that uh, marketing educators would deny that because I have testimony to that. So um, that's what I have to say about uh, the marketing department. Um, again, I'd like to talk about the students. Uh, I feel that um, the level of student has changed here. We have had uh, better students than we have now. Uh, our and maybe that's um, prevalent throughout the country as far as students are concerned. Um, I find that uh, they like a lot of spoon feeding and uh, this department is a more sophisticated department. We teach the theory as though you would learn it in any major college in this country. And I don't approve of spoon feeding. I approve of students taking a responsibility in their hands. Uh, when assignments are given, I expect that they be done and be done well. So I think that our standards in this department have risen. I think our faculty, our new adjunct faculty, is far different from what it was when we first started. Everybody in this department must be hired with either an MBA or a PhD in the related marketing areas. So I feel that our school has grown in stature, not only in FIT, but throughout the country. These uh, people come with experience in the field also. Do you look for experience? Absolutely. If I can get the combination of apparel experience or fashion experience, that's 
very, very desirable. However, I will accept, um, we vote in our department, as in every department in this college, we vote on the credentials of every uh, adjunct faculty. And I find that if we have an excellent market research person, or we have uh, uh, an excellent uh, product development person who has worked for Procter & Gamble, uh, we will be very interested in looking at that person because again it's our department is generic in nature however it has fashion and related industries with it what I try to do when I teach marketing and uh, the capstone course which is called strategic planning since I have a very strong background in the fashion business my examples come primarily from the fashion business because as i said before fashion stands it also changes but theory really stands so you can apply the theory to the fashion business for instance if you will take a, a company like liz claiborne liz claiborne has many divisions and in today's world, we talk about strategic business units in strategic planning. How do you apply that concept, which is very generic in nature, and multinational companies use strategic business units? How do we apply that so the students can understand that they too must know fashion in its pure, uh, um, uh, marketing in its pure sense so that they can apply that exact theory to a Liz Claiborne company that is today also multinational. They're opening up stores in various parts of the world and they do very little onshore producing. Most of their companies are offshore production. How do you take a company like uh, Alice Claiborne and, and apply it to a sophisticated concept like a strategic business unit? Well, we do. And we show our students, at least I show my students, how that relates to a common particular market, for instance, a petite market, for instance, a junior market, of which Liz Claiborne is involved in, coat suits, dresses, how do they uh, separate a market and cater to that specifically? And they are successful because they know what they're doing, and I feel that our students and I tell them that all the time, that they will have the edge when they go into an industry because not only do they know the real theory, but now they understand that it can be done in a company like Alice Claiborne and can make a very, very valuable contribution to that company because of their fashion background and because of the pure generic background. What proportion of these companies have their home offices in the New York metropolitan area? Like Liz Most all have a new. That's where they began. That's where they were born. Yeah. They were born here, and because of uh, uh, production and um, uh, cheaper production in foreign countries, uh, even Bill Blass uh, goes to foreign countries to produce. Do we keep linkages to these uh, organizations? Absolutely. I mean, we have linkages through the whole world. Today, what we call um, uh, information systems, marketing intelligence systems, um, and marketing Here at FIT, do we? Do we have linkages to no. these systems or companies? The companies. Absolutely. I mean, that's what FIT is about, that we try to be linked to the companies. Um, Could you be a little specific about that example? Yes, I am. Um, um, in the, uh, let's say, in the apparel business, I uh, we have internships, you know, where students go in uh, to internship areas, and so therefore there is a definite linkage. Uh, what 
we like to do is very often have guest speakers who come in from these companies to show you how, show the students how uh, their marketing programs are developed, how they work, and how the marketing system is applicable to the fashion business. So uh, we do try very hard to do that. I know in the lower division they take them out on trips. I don't take my students out that much on trips. I did take them to uh, Liz Claiborne for a number of years and they did a very good job. Recently I have not, but I do call in some uh, people from the apparel business and uh, the fashion business to give us examples of how the marketing process works. They get an uh, associate's degree in this BA program. And um, this program that you're talking to now is the BS program. There is no BA in this school. There's a Bachelor of Science degree, fashion related industries. That's what it is. And as I, re I said before, and I will repeat it and emphasize it, that anybody who's going to get a BS degree, fashion related industries, must take these generic marketing courses. And they come from a variety of majors to your upper division program? Or uh, they traditionally, what are the students, what's the pool of students? Are they from other colleges as well? Yes, they do. From They come from uh, colleges, uh, from a two-year college that are feeder programs that come into the upper division. And a lot of them have uh, uh, fashion buying and merchandising degrees. We are now trying to open that up to other students as well, make it a little bit broader so that uh, these students can satisfy uh, the other areas of specialization, which will give them a bachelor's degree. Could be cosmetic marketing that is now looking at that, and I'm sure Peg Smith can address that very well. So. Uh, and in here, we have students coming from the lower division. That's a, one of our major feeders from the FBM department and advertising communication. And what about other colleges? Where do the students come from? If you look at the students, where are they coming from? They're from New York City. They're from around. They're the world. Uh, we. Uh, what makes FIT very very interesting is that we have students coming from all over the world. We have students from uh, the um, colleges that we articulate with. Those are colleges that have a connection with us. Yes. That's our community, um, Kingsboro community. Um, I think we now have an articulation with Brookdale. And I think that um, uh, the admissions office and the registrar's office can address that more fully. That's from here. We have students from California. We have students coming from all over. On the other hand, we have students coming from foreign countries that contribute a lot to this school. We have a very strong Asian population that's coming in, and they are excellent students. We have students from all over. Sweden, Norway. Um, I've had some in my classes. Last term I had a student from, I think, Argentina. Um, excellent. And the foreign students uh, really respect the instructor. They have a lot of respect for learning and for the instructor, I would say much more so than our American students. And I don't like to say that, but that's the way it is. Their attitude towards learning is a little bit different. And the graduates, the program, have you, do you keep in touch? And, uh, the alumni. Yes. yes, we try to keep in touch with the alumni. Um, uh, we have a list of alumni that we try to keep in touch with. And um, uh, just to get back to my earlier days at FIT, um, 
I was the faculty advisor to the Merchandise Management Society, which is really a lower division society. It was um, wonderful, very active, very, very, very active. We had, uh, I mean, I don't know how many students in there, a couple of hundred, 100, maybe a little less, maybe 150. We used D211 room and there were no seats. You couldn't, and that room gets 99 students in it. But the moment that I uh, knew that I was going to be the chairman of this department, I affiliated with the American Marketing Association, the collegiate chapter. That chapter, first the senior, the professional chapter is a very professional chapter. The American Marketing Association is, it's called American Marketing, but it's international in scope. And anybody who is anybody in marketing, as far as a professional is concerned, belongs to the AMA. I felt at the time that our students should become immediately affiliated with the collegiate chapter of the American Marketing Association. In order to affiliate, you have to do a lot of things. You have to perform by their standards. Uh, first, you must have 25 people in the club. Then we do an annual plan, which becomes competitive in nature throughout the country. They must have that chapter plan in by a certain date, looked at by many top marketers. And every year we have a com competition in New Orleans. And at that time, we went to New Orleans. We are now going to go to New Orleans. I go to New Orleans with my students. And FIT, who? Who is FIT? What is FIT? FIT, FIT. Now, you know the, the best colleges in the country belong to AMA collegiate chapters. So uh, we were uh, who? And uh, through the years, uh, we have won national awards. And now they don't ask about FIT who. They know very well who FIT is, meaning the colleges, meaning the professors of those colleges. So FIT is no longer considered a fashion school only, of which we are proud of, I might say. But FIT, on the other hand, is considered a business school. That has been my aim all along. I worked very hard and very long to get that recognition. Whether it's uh, really uh, accepted or looked upon in this school, I'm not so sure. Uh, I have to say it, everybody has their own agenda here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the country knows who FIT is. The colleges know that when we come, we have something con to contribute to that uh, club, of which I would say close to 2,000 students attend this conference. This is not, uh, you know, a little conference. It's a nation, national conference, and we compete in that conference, and as I said, we won a number of times, and last term, last year, we won nationwide. And I sent uh, a notice, I got a congratulatory letter from AMA, and I sent it to President uh, Hirschfeld. I thought he ought to know about this, because our, our, my aim is to get this college recognized as a viable business school. 
so now we're trying to, at least I am trying to uh, make it more viable. We have all these areas of specialization and our department is uh, very concerned uh, that it may not be a department because these other options feel that they're going to teach their marketing courses according to their area. So uh, we have now prevailed upon the college wide that we are hopefully here to stay. So now we are working on a major, our own major. Hopefully that will go into gear fairly soon. And that major will be generic marketing. And now what do I mean by that again? Uh, you know it's in its pure sense. Generic means pure. Okay, now what do I mean by that? I have interviewed students in this college. My faculty has interviewed students in this college. How do you feel about getting the degree in marketing in its pure sense and this is really what most of them I must say want so hopefully our feeder will come from some of our students who feel that they have had a lot of fashion in the two-year program because the two-year program is mostly skills the upper division, this area, will give them really the pure marketing courses that other colleges as well give. So a lot of our faculty, not my department, but a lot of the faculty feel, well, uh, students don't come to FIT for marketing. They could get that at other colleges. What other colleges in the area offer it? Baruch. I taught there for 13 years as an adjunct. Uh, NYU, Pace, Fordham. They all have marketing majors. They all have marketing majors. On the other hand, the students that come into that program do not have the fashion skills that the students from this school or Nassau or Kingsborough have and the students a lot of them feel that they that have come from these feeder colleges feel that they have had a lot of fashion on the other hand they would love to have a degree in marketing of generic marketing they want to learn more about pure marketing because some of our students are intelligent enough to know uh, that a broad-based program makes them much more marketable. And I have talked to many chairmen uh, that are from four-year colleges, like Rutgers, like NYU, like uh, Baruch, uh, a number, uh, Texas A&M, prolific textbook writer looked at our curriculum and he said I think that it is very wise for us to have a degree in marketing not just fashion related um, areas students can can take areas of specialization but to have an upper degree program in pure marketing is really the way to go. Now, as I said, that's one of the reasons I have and my department has made a lot of enemies in this school because I'm not going to say mention the name, but everybody, but that particular person said we're a very turfed school. Well, that's all well and good if you want to be turfed, but how about uh, your interest in the students? and how do uh, they really feel and uh, how marketable are these all these other programs uh, granted some of them are marketable but some of them should be minors and the major should be marketing so you see this as a future a future direction of the program my program yes my marketing uh, department hopefully will go in that direction 
if I have anything to say about it, because I feel that that's the most professional approach to uh, a discipline such as marketing, and marketing is indeed a discipline. It's a major in every college. Advertising is a function of marketing. It's not the other way around, as some people claim in this school. It is definitely not. Marketing is the driving force behind advertising and merchandising. Some people, again, may not like me for saying that, but let them talk to any marketing educator or professional. And I have talked to many, many, to see if my case is right or wrong. And my case happens to be right. So, therefore, there is conflict in the college about how I feel, how some of my faculty feel. What role do is the industries play any role in shaping the direction of FIT on something like this? Uh, yes, we have had industry people come in and they feel very much, if you're talking about marketing people, yes. this is the way to go. Do you have an advisory council yes. as well? Absolutely. We have an advisory council who feels very much the way we do. Right. They all feel that uh, these areas of specialization, which are now becoming, uh, they're trying to become uh, freestanding uh, uh, with their own degrees, uh, the people in, in my advisory board uh, feel that marketing is the way to go. And these are pure marketers. These are marketers who have MBAs and have worked in, in major companies. They, they have PhDs in marketing and work in major companies. And they're on our industry advisory board and uh, sometimes get very disturbed about this situation. So some of it you could put in, some of it you could leave out, but I am telling you that's the way it is. And then there are some people in the industry that feel they have a, uh, uh, for instance, the cosmetic people feel they have uh, an important area in FIT. You know, uh, uh, funding, uh, they fund the, the cosmetic department, you know, to with laboratory and things like that. So uh, these are the, the, uh, the, that's the other argument. Uh, but uh, I feel, and my department feels very strongly the way I do, um, our industry advisory board feels very strongly the way I do. Does you, your, uh, do they, the advisory board provide funding for your program? No. Well? And maybe some of them should. I don't know. I mean, I have not approached them on that because of the very nature of the generics. In other words, like a Procter & Gamble, um, how would they fund this program? So it would have to come from people in the apparel industry or the fashion business that feel the way I do. And I have testimony to that also. I, uh, about a year, a year and a half ago, I was out in the industry getting letters of testimony. It was already presented to the curriculum committee. Some people on the curriculum committee feel very much the way I do, uh, that that's the way to go, you know, to have a pure marketing department and have these areas of specialization as just that, areas of specialization, like a major and a minor. And if you don't want to call them a minor, call them an area of specialization. Are there other issues you'd like to address in the uh, oral history? Um, what are some of the areas that you might uh, think that I should well, uh, critical, talk about? Possibly, you know, uh, anecdotes about critical events in the development of the program that you'd like to be included in the archives. You know, marketing, as you mentioned, this outstanding winning of the national competition. That was, that is a very yeah. critical thing, and it has given our school a lot of stature. Linkages, you know, with any industry that you might want to mention? Or 
Well, we're, I am, I'm still linked in, in many ways to the apparel business because I, as chair, uh, come from the apparel industry, um, and uh, I am linked to that industry because uh, some time ago I went to visit a major firm, and um, they said, well, how do you teach strategies? And they said, oh, give me the diagram. And I don't even have a diagram. I put it on the board. But if you want one, I will give you one. And they're using that kind of strategy for their various companies. So I thought that was rather critical. And I'm not making this story up. It's a major company who now has problems. You know, they have uh, some problems. But one of the, uh, the CEO was on our board of trustees. And um, he, we've done a lot of business together through the years. So I have a very warm spot for him, and he happens to be an exceptionally nice person. So I, I have to say that about him. He's just a, a dear and um, a very, very, uh, he's on our board. And um, I'm sure some people will know who I'm talking about. You know what I mentioned. Just remember, this will be a tape fair for posterity. So, I mean, it's up to you whether you want to decide, obviously, you know, whether you want to mention the company or not. Well, it's Leslie Fay. Oh, it's Leslie Fay. John Very Pomerantz. John Pomerantz. He's on our board yes, of trustees. Yes. And one of the nicest, finest, most wonderful human beings. I can tell you that because I used to do a lot of business with him. And how did I do business with him? Um, his father was a manufacturer, Broadway manufacturer, manufactured what do you clothes. Mean Broadway manufacturer. <laughs> you know that's the jargon in in our industry. He manufactured clothes that were far less expensive. And his father's place of business was in 1400 Broadway. Now John Pomerantz has an MBA from Wharton, and his father is going to teach him the dress business, which he did. And he opened up a company for him. And it was called Casper. And uh, John Pomerantz was a young man, and he uh, was in business. His father helped him to get into that business. That business was uh, just the opposite of the kind of clothes his father manufactured, high price clothes. And since I was that price range buyer, I used to do a lot of business with John Pomerantz. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And his brother-in-law was in that business as since the brother-in-law, the sister has divorced the um, brother-in-law, but, um, John Mother Palmer. Was an, uh, expensive clothes too? Yeah. They were they, the two the, the father opened up this business for both for both boys, so to speak. And I did a lot of business at that time with Casper. And and Johnny Pomerantz. And uh, I mean I have very, very good memories and we, when we see each other it's you know, this very, very warm uh, friendship. That became Leslie Fay. His father was Leslie Fay. Oh, his father was Leslie. Leslie Fay. Uh, and they have many divisions, even oh. to this day. And I might say that when I teach strategic planning, I used him as an example. First of all, uh, why shouldn't he get the credit? He is uh, one of our board of trustees. And when I put a diagram on the board about what we call strategic business units, I put the CEO, John Pomerantz. And from then on, we get an organizational chart. And at that time, uh, I'm sure there, 
uh, less companies today, but uh, just uh, not too long ago, I think there were 52 divisions. And if that isn't what I would call a major company in the apparel business, teaching our students pure marketing, generic in its sense, as a good example of fashion-related industries. Uh, the manufacturing now goes offshore. Most of the manufacturing is done I would say a lot of... But I, in other countries, when you mean offshore, you say... Offshore is other countries right. throughout the world. And we're constantly looking for right. other countries throughout the world. And that's a course that but we... Mean we I mean, as a marketing person? As a ma yes, as manufacturers yeah. all over the world, we are trying to find out where we can get the best for the least, so to speak. So now we have an area, international trade, and that course is now specifically in that international trade area. It's spun off into that area. So uh, sourcing is sourcing, whether it's for the apparel business or for uh, sourcing pet and food. Finding a place to manufacture it. Right. Whether it's pet food, and I almost hired somebody who was, he had uh, absolute impeccable credentials. Not only was he an expert marketer, but he was an international lawyer who was in the pet food business. His parents were in the pet food business, sourcing all over the world for pet food. Now, I think he could make a contribution to our department. And at the moment, he turned us down. And that's not to say that I won't go after him again, because that's a valuable person to have in our department. But he was teaching at NYU Graduate School, and this was the first time that he was teaching, so he didn't want to take on more. And you would have brought him in as an adjunct? Or? Yes, an adjunct a part-time adjunct instructor. And how do you find the adjuncts, like a fellow like that? In what sense? How does you find uh, somebody who you advertise in the paper? To oh, how do I find yes. them? Uh, no, I don't, um, I haven't found any adjuncts through the paper. What I do is I call my friends in various universities who are chairs of marketing departments who can recommend uh, people from their department who may be looking for adjunct positions. And I have been very successful that way. So getting an instructor from NYU, getting an instructor from Baruch, uh, all these people have doctorates. Um, some have MBAs. Most of them have doctorates, and I feel that's a good credential. And um, uh, they come well recommended, naturally, with their resume. And then I present it to the department if we feel that they, and we interview them, you know, the, the way you do it in every department, if we feel that they uh, can make a contribution, that's how we hire them. And I would say that's how my department grew in stature. Uh, how many full-timers and part-timers do you have? We have six full-timers, and every semester the adjuncts vary. Sometimes it's 15, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more, depending on the uh, number of classes we have in the daytime running and in the evening. And how many do you have uh, students in your department to, uh, you know, working on? As I mentioned to you, every other, every student in every area of specialization, and I'm repeating it, I want the world to know that, that every student needs our degree right, right now, currently. So I took some numbers, not because of this, but some other situation, and I got the numbers. And the total that come into our program every year in September, I might say as of this year, there were 347 coming in, plus what's here. Which is when you say here. The, that are currently yes, enrolled. Which is about just a ballpark figure. 
a couple of hundred. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the program? No, I'd like to say that I would like to see uh, the, um, the future of this school be as competitive as any college in the country relating to professional marketing. I feel that is urgent in this time when uh, we have downsizing of companies. I think that every student, and, and I said that to President Hirschfield, every student walking in should be as good as the person that went in before him and the one that's behind him. And when he goes into an interview, he should be as prepared, knowledgeable about the discipline of marketing. Okay. Thank you very much, unless you'd like to add something. Mm -mm. I don't think so. I think I've said it all.